Try to finish the gown of the Green Knight quickly. I know. It's hot. Oh. <laughs> and get into Canterbury Tales. Probably not going to happen. So, I said we were going to pick up around 2140. I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, Twenty ninety and following. Sir Gowan's being led by the porter or guide of the knight of the castle. He says, I know who you are, etc., etc. And 2096, if you'd follow my advice, it would be better for you. The place you're going to is extremely dangerous. There lives a man in that wilderness, worst in the world. He is powerful and grim, loves dealing blows, bigger than any other man, blah, 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 blah. So, therefore, 2118, Sir Gowan, let the man be. Leave him alone. And for God's sake, get away from here by some other road. Go through, go through another country. Christ can be your help. I'll go home. I'll tell everybody. I'll swear by God and all his virtuous saints. And help me, God, and the holy thing and many more oaths. I'll keep your secret. In other words, I'll lie for you. He's going to swear. You know. And so down says, good luck to you. You wish me good. You would keep my secret. But... If I avoided this place, took to my heels in fright to the way you propose, I should be a cowardly knight and could not be excused. I will go to the chapel, whence may chance, and discuss with that man whatever matter I please. Okay. Whether good or ill come of it, as destiny decides. Destiny and what else? The little green girdle he's wearing. Or green sash that he's wearing, right? Because he hasn't given that up, and he was told the man who wears that cannot be killed. So it's kind of like he's trying to take an in run around destiny with this thing. I mean, this is his all state insurance policy. <laughs> the other man says, All right, you know, have fun storming the castle. So, I won't hinder you. Put on your helmet, take your spear, go down the track, see that rock, take a right, etc., etc. So, 2160 and following, Sir Gowan makes his way. He goes down, and he doesn't see any building, 2164. But high and steep hillsides upon both sides, rough rocky crags of jagged stones, clouds grazing the jutting rocks as it seemed. Then he halts, he looks for a chapel. Now, what's he looking for? Stone building, arches, you know. He sees nothing of the kind anywhere. Except, a way off, in a glade, that is, in an opening in the trees. So, trees first, a little opening. He sees something like a mound. A rounded hillock on the bank of the stream, near the bed of a torrent that tumbled there. Water foamed in its course as though it had boiled. The knight urges, you know, echoes of Beowulf, right? The knight urges his horse, comes to the mound, gets off his horse, ties it to a tree, doesn't want the horse running off. He goes to the mound. He walks around it, all the way around it, wondering what it could be. It had a hole at the end and on either side. Mound looks like this. It has a hole on one end, an entrance, and then apparently on either side. I don't think it's a hole here and then another hole here because I don't think that's what's meant by either side. Covered all over, patches of grass, all hollow inside. So it's not just a mound of dirt with a hole. It's built this way. Okay, so that you can go in and it, you know, he can stand up in there. All right. There's places like this in England and Scotland. Go to Mace Howe, where? In the Orkneys, I think. Um, and you have one of these. This thing's like 5,000 years old. Okay. Nothing but an old cave or a fissure in an old rock, but to call it, he hardly could tell. He says, is this the green chapel? Here, probably at midnight, the devil his matin says. 
<laughs> now this is a desolate place. Chapel looks evil with brass overgrown. Here fittingly might the man dressed in green perform his devotions in devilish ways. Now all my senses tell me that the devil himself has forced this agreement on me. Now he comes to his quote-unquote senses and says, damn, tricked by the devil. Right? Is there anything in here that tells him this is of the devil? Is there a pentagram? Are there, you know, uh, half-eaten human corpses? Uh, Human-like things with goats' hooves and tails and horns? No. 666 all over the place? No. <laughs> Nothing. It's what? It's not natural. It is human-made, but it, it's... It is yeah, I mean, it's covered with grass. It looks very natural, okay? What's he doing? He's jumping to conclusions, right? Based on very little evidence. This is a chapel of disaster. May ill luck befall it. So now he's wishing ill on this thing. It is the most damnable church I was ever inside. He's not heard one word said inside this quote-unquote church. Okay? So he climbs up onto the top of it. Heard, heard, heard up the hillside from behind a great rock on the slope across the stream a deafening noise. He doesn't hear yelling and screaming. <coughs> What's the deafening noise? As a giant whetstone is being turned and an axe or sword is being sharpened on it. It whirred and sang like water at a mill. It rasped and it rang, terrible to hear. And he's like, this is a welcoming. He's trying to scare me. Well, God's will be done. So he yells out. Who's master of this place to keep tryst with me? For now is good Gawain waiting right here. If anyone wants something, let him hurry here fast. In other words, tick tock. <laughs> I'll give you five more minutes. You know, it's like students when a professor's late. They go by the, you know, it's full professor, 15 minute rule, associate tick. How long do I have to wait? She goes like, I was here. You weren't. I mean, he met the terms of the agreement, right? He showed up, Green Chapel, New Year's Day, you weren't here, I left. He didn't say how long to wait. Wait, he hears a voice. You shall quickly have all that I promised you once. And then makes his way among the rocks, bursting out of a hole, whirling out of a nook with a fearsome weapon, a Danish axe newly made for dealing the blow with a massive blade, curving back on the shaft, honed with a whetstone four feet across. So this blade looks kind of like this. Your book has a picture of it. The blade is like that. And this one's four feet across. Sharp. Really sharp. Now, no less than that, despite the gleaming green girdle and the man in the green dressed as at first, both his flesh and his legs, hair and beard, etc., etc. And he says, Gawain, may God protect you. Now, is that something the devil would say? Would Satan go, I'm about to eat your soul. May God protect you. <laughs> Probably not. You are indeed welcome, sir, to my place. You have timed your journey as a true man should. In other words, we'll check off that box. He's true. And you know the agreement settled between us 12 months ago. You took what fell to your lot. I was, okay, so here we are by ourselves. Nobody to separate us so we can fight as we please. Take your helmet off. Come on. I did. Here, get your pay. Make no more argument than I offered you then. In other words, don't try and stall me. Sir Gallon. No, by God, who gave me a soul. I shall bear you no grudge at all, whatever hurt comes about. Just limit yourself to one blow, 
In other words, don't go for seconds, you know. And I will stand still and not resist whatever pleases you to do at all. Bends over, bowed, shows them flesh all bare, and seeming unafraid, he would not shrink in fear. Seeming unafraid, however, our poet tells us. So the man dressed in green gets ready. He raises the terrible axe. All the strength in his body he heaves in his air. Remember, this guy's huge. So he raises that axe, and he really, I mean, the axe is down here. He swings it up, stands on his toes, and he's getting ready to, you know, swing Merrill swing, you know. <laughs> Swung it as fiercely as if meaning to mangle him. Had he brought the axe down as forcibly as he acted, that courageous knight would have been killed by the blow. But Gawain does what? He glances sideways and does this. He just made his neck smaller. By flinching, he doesn't give the knight a space to hit. I mean, yeah, he could chop to his head, but, you know, that's not pretty. <laughs> Hunched his shoulders a little to resist the sharp blade. The other man checked the bright steel with a jerk. It says, you're not Gawain, who is reputed so good, reputed, your reputation precedes you, who never quailed from an army on valley or on hill and now flinches <clears throat> for fear. What? Before he feels any hurt? He's flinching for what? As I was just talking about in my Shakespeare class. His fear of the unknown. What's the unknown? He thinks it's known. He thinks it's a big giant axe coming down to chop his head off. He doesn't know that's going to happen, though. Why? Because it hasn't happened yet. Okay? I never heard of such cowardice shown by that. I never, I, I didn't flinch nor flee when you aimed once at me, nor raised any objections. My head fell to the floor. Yet I gave no ground. That is, I didn't even fall. I picked my head up and I, you know, rode like a true knight out of there. You know, head held high. <laughs> so I deserve to be reckoned the better man for that. Ground. I flinched once. I won't do it twice. It's like, buddy, you're already lost. You know. You flinched. Though if my head should fall, I, I cannot put it back. You know, you got to admit, buddy. I mean, hurry up, man. By your faith, come to the point. Deal out my faith to me. Do it out of hand. For I shall let you strike a blow and not move again until your ex has hit me. Take my true word. He goes, all right. Get in position again. He swings at his, his ex at him savagely without harming. He swings... And he lets the axe go near Gawain, so it hits the ground, but it doesn't hit him. He checked his blow. Gawain awaits it submissively, not moving a little. He's like, oh, okay, so now you found your courage again. Okay, third time's a... <laughs> Notice, so Gawain is clueless. We talked about the other day. What are the three motifs? Beheading game, exchange of wings, temptation. Okay. Notice the beheading game is what starts the poem off, and it's what concludes the poem. But the beheading game also brings these in as subsets of it. At the end, first strike isn't really a strike. Why? Because Gawain flinches. Second strike isn't really a strike. Why? Because now he has his courage back. So the knight takes the third strike, and what does he do? Gives him a nick. Not a gaping wound. It's a nick. He's bleeding from it. Okay. Why? Because of this. So, 
He brings it down straight with the cutting edge of the blade over Gawain's bare neck, although he struck fiercely here, no, no more than to slash the back of his neck, laying open the skin. The blade cut into the body through the fair flesh, and that bright blood shot over his shoulders to the ground. And when the knight saw his blood spatter in the snow, that it bleeds. It's not, you know, Monty Python psh, 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 wound. He does what? He jumps with both feet more than a spear's length. Well, the spear's about seven, eight feet long. He just does a standing broad jump of seven or eight feet. Why? He's getting away from the knight. Snatches up his helmet, puts it on his head, jerks his shoulders, brings his shield down. In other words, getting ready to fight. And the knight's just standing there, hand on the haft, laughing at him. Sir Gowan says, don't you try that again. You got your swing and blah, 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 blah. The knight kept his distance, rested on his axe, set the haft on the ground, shaft on the ground, leaned on the blade, contemplating the man, seeing how valiant and fearlessly bold he was. And he says, don't act so wrathfully in this place. Don't act so wrathfully in this place. Why? What is this place? It's a chapel. One shouldn't show wrath in a chapel. Why? Because it's the second of the seven deadly sins. What's the first? Pride. Okay. What's been... I'm trying to think of the verb tense. What has been being or being been, whatever, appealed to on Sir Gowan's part almost throughout the poem? His sense of pride. What do they keep saying? Are you you really, Sir Gowan? You're the one, the model of all virtue and courtly behavior and romantic speech, etc., etc. Okay? Don't act so wrathfully in this place. No one has discourteously mistreated you. He brings up the idea of courtesy. Or acted contrary to the covenant sworn at the king's court. I promised you a blow. You have it. That's it. Think yourself well paid. I free you from the rest of all other obligations. And he's probably sitting there going, what other obligations? What are you talking about? Had I been more dexterous, why dexterous? Amelia, why did you just do that? Faithful in his five fingers. Dexterity. The knight is playing on that. Okay? It's almost like the knight knows about what the endless knot signifies. Had I been more dexterous, maybe I could have dealt you a more spiteful blow to have roused your anger. Why spiteful? Why does the green knight, why should he have any spite? Whoosh, completely over Sir Gallant's head. He's sitting there going, what the hell are you talking about? First I threatened you playfully with a pretense and avoided giving you a gash, doing so rightly because of the agreement we made on the first night. First night, what's Sir Gowan thinking? Yeah, a year ago, we made an agreement, okay? What do you mean first night? Because first implies what? Second, third, fourth, fifth. Use those ordinal numbers instead of cardinal numbers because there's a list coming. Hmm. When you faithfully and truly kept your pledged word, gave me all your winnings as an honest man should. And he just links this with this. Hmm. The other faint, next one, I gave you for the next day. When you kissed my lovely wife and gave me those kisses for both occasions, I aimed at you two mere mock blows without harm. True man must pay back truly. In other words, I gave you, dear boar fox, now I give you one, two, three, and he's kind of saying, and I am repaying you here for what you gave me here. Oh, by the way, the belt you're wearing, that same woven girdle, my own wife gave it to you. I know well in truth. I, I know all about your kisses and your courteous manners. 
Notice if she had gotten him to, quote unquote, fall into sin, what else would he be saying? I know about your kisses and everything else. Probably wouldn't be just a neck. <laughs> and my wife's wooing of you. I arranged it myself. My name is Sir Penderis. No, he's not a Pandar. What? I arranged it. This is why the poet says, whatever her intentions, evil was not purposed on either part. Right? Her intention wasn't evil. She wasn't really trying to get Sir Gowan into the bed. When you read those temptations in the light of this, what does it tell us about those temptations? What does Sir Gowan say? Yes! I'm the luckiest man in the world. She would have said, uh, 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 no way, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to go get my big green husband, you know, and he's going to. I sent her to test you. And he even said each night what? I've tested you once. I've tested you twice. Third time's a charm. And to me, truly, you seem one of, the, one of the most perfect men who ever walked on the earth. Well, the poet earlier describes him as the most perfect. As pearls are more valuable than the white pea, so is Sir Gowan, in all truth, before other fair knights. Only here you, you fell a little short, and you lacked fidelity. Here where? Not for fine print. You, you didn't like the green belt because of how it was so cunningly made. Nope. You didn't give in to the temptation of her wooing you. Nope. Here's where you failed. You wanted to live. Basic human preservation instinct kicked in. All living things Try to, you know, back away, if they're sentient of any sort, back away from death. You wanted to live, so I blame you. I, I can't blame you for wanting to live. That other brave man stood speechless along. He's still trying to figure all this out. He's still, wait, wait. But you weren't green. Because if I got in the castle and I saw a big green guy, I'd go, hmm. So mortified and crushed that he inwardly squirmed. All the blood in his body burned in his face. Why? He's embarrassed. He's ashamed. So that he went with shame at what the man said. A curse upon cowardice and covetousness. Cowardice? Where did he show cowardice? When he flinched? Possibly. When he accepted the belt. This will keep me living, rather than being willing to take what he gave the Green Knight. Covetousness? Okay, yeah, I'll take it if it, you know, puts me in good hands, so to speak. You breed, cowardice and covetousness, breed boorishness and vice that ruin virtue. Well, what other vice? other than wanting to live, that's not really a vice. So covetousness, cowardiceness, what else? He lied to the knight. He said confession that morning, and yet it's pretty clear he intended what later on that evening? To lie. To break his word. But as I raised the other day, he can't say confession for that because it's not a sin he's yet done. But he kind of could say, uh, Father, here's what I'm planning to do, and what would the priest go? No, 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 you cannot do that. And the priest would probably say, nor can I absolve you of the sins you've even confessed. Why? Because you're still planning on doing one. Because you leave confession, you're supposed to be clean. Huh. Takes the belt off. There it is. Take your stupid little belt back. <laughs> False thing. It's a thing. How can it be false? The devil take it. For fear of your blow, taught 
me cowardice. Did it? Did it teach him cowardice? Did Sir Gawain not have any cowardice before then? See, I think this is where the narrator is actually not being unreliable, but he's saying something that's not quite true. I think the narrator wants us to see he didn't teach Sir Gawain cowardice. What's the... Yeah, it is taught in the Middle English. I think it actually revealed the cowardice that was already there. And maybe that's what he means. Because in true Socrates fashion, you know, when you learn something, what are you really doing? You're bringing out what you already actually know. So was everything prior to that all part of the act? I'm Sir Gowan, I'm brave, I'm brave. Until somebody bigger, stronger, more powerful and green <laughs> comes in. <laughs> To give way, your blow taught me cowardice to give way to covetousness. To be false to my nature. What is he saying is his nature? Bravery. To be true, to be honest, to be faithful, to wear the <coughs> emblem of fidelity. And yet... What is Sir Gowan? Basic level. He is a human being. What did the medieval church teach, and the church still today, teach about <laughs> human beings outside the Garden of Eden? Fallen. The nature is fallen. Evil, sin, runs through the veins. And Sir Gowan's kind of implying well, not me. <laughs> I'm the exception. After all, we were told they were going to sing what on Christmas Day? Songs about Sir Gowan's birth. Little, you know, a bit of mixing there. Of songs they should be singing. False to my nature. Well, what does he say is the nature? He's not talking about human nature. The generosity and fidelity expected of knights. But that's not nature. That's what? That's nurture. <laughs> that's what you're taught. Okay? He is saying, I am knightly by my birth. <clears throat> no. I think the poet is telling us no. Just as Chaucer is going to do in the Canterbury Tales with the wife of Bastel. With the lo loathly old lady who upbraids the knight and says, here you are, you're talking about honor and nobility and all this stuff, and look how you treat me. That's not honorable. Honor, nobility, is how you behave. And you don't get it in your blood. You don't get it in your DNA. You what? You learn it. Here, sir, humbly I confess, my good name is marred. Let me regain your trust. Next time I'll be on guard. Notice, let me regain. Next time. Let's do it again. And you won't catch me. The other man laughs. Wrong you did me, I consider wiped out. Absolved. This is what, after all? A chapel. And he's the presiding officer of the chapel. He's the priest of the green chapel. And what has he done? He has heard Sir Gallant's confession, and now he has absolved him of that sin. You have so cleanly confessed yourself, admitted your fault, done honest penance on the edge of my blade, that is, you bled for it, connecting him with Christ, who bled a whole lot more. I declare you absolved of that offense and washed as clean as if you had never transgressed since the day you were born. And in the medieval Christian tradition and the current depending on the 
confession of faith that uses confessions. That's what happens in confession. You walk out of that confession clean, wiped clean. Every sin done until that moment, gone. That's what the Green Knight just says about Sir Gawain. And yet he leaves from there, and what does he think? I still screwed up. I still screwed up. So he takes the sash and wears it out. Does he wear it as a badge of honor? No. He wears it for what reason? It's a reminder. In a sense, it's a memento mori. It's a reminder of his death. What death, however? The death of his good name. The death of his pride. It's a reminder of his real nature. Okay? So, the knight says, let's go back to the castle. We'll have a few beers. I should reconcile you with my wife. It's like, they were pretty close to reconciled, you know, before. Who is your cunning foe? He says, no, 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 I've stayed too long. I should get it back home. He goes, yeah, but you, you need to know the rest of the story. And what does Sir Gowan do? He launches into a diatribe. Against whom? Women. It's all women's fault. It is no wonder, 24, 13, 14, if a fool acts insanely and is brought to grief through womanly wild. For so was Adam beguiled by one. And what is he doing in saying this? He's doing the exact same damn thing Adam did in the garden. God comes. Adam says, uh, we're naked, so we hid from you. Who told you we were naked? Uh, the woman that you gave me gave me from the tree to eat. And she says, yeah, but the serpent gave me. So what has Adam just done? He passed the buck. He didn't take responsibility. He didn't, quote unquote, confess. He said, no, 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 it wasn't my fault. She tempted me. It's like the old Flip Wilson TV show when Flip Wilson would come out dressed as Geraldine. And he'd always go, the devil made me do it. You know, the devil made me do it. Okay? That's what he's doing here. He's blaming women for what? His problems. Okay? Big long speech, by the way. He says, but the belt I'll keep. God repay for that. I accept it gratefully, not for its wonderful gold, 2430, nor for the girdle itself, nor its silk, blah, blah, blah. But so I can look at it as a sign of my failing. And when I ride in triumph, when people are hailing me and praising me, what? With remorse, it will recall the corruption and frailty of the perverse flesh. While they're praising me, I will think to myself, I am as a dead man. Several of the, of the desert fathers of the early Christian church say, you know the best way to deal with praise and censure of people? Act like a dead man. And this one guy tells a story, you know. I went out to corpse, and I just railed at it. You dirty, rotten son of a... Blah, 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 you know. And what do you think the corpse did? Nothing. And I went out to the corpse the next day, and I praised it. And, I, and what did the corpse do? Nothing. Be like the corpse. So when someone rips you apart, what does Polonius tell Laertes? Take every man's censure. Give no man thy tongue. Take every man's censure means let people say what they want about you. Don't respond. Similarly, when they praise you, don't respond. Don't respond there means don't believe it. Don't believe it. That's the problem with almost all of our politicians. They believe all the praise. They get angry at all the censure. Okay? So he says, this will what? 
it will humble my heart. Why? Because I think Sir Gowan believed his press clippings. Proverbially. He believed what people said about him. I, I really am the model of all virtue. I really am the source of all good manners. Oh, you, you're so lucky to be in my presence. All right? But he goes on and says, oh, I should tell you, by the way, I, my real name, 2445, Bertilac of Haute Desert. Bertilac, Green Lake, Hope Desert by the High Desert. That's what the name means. So literary scholars for 200 years have been trying to find the Green Lake by the High Desert in Scotland or Northern England. You know, and you have the Lake District of England, and there are Green Lakes by High Moors. Maybe it's one of these. Well, that is an area somewhat near Chester and such. He says... Through the power of Morgan Le Fay, who lives under my roof, her skill and learning, well taught in magic arts, she has acquired many of Merlin's occult powers. She had loved dealings at an earlier time without accomplished scholar, in other words, sex, as all your knights know at home. Morgan the goddess, therefore, is her name. No one, however haughty or proud, she cannot tame. She sent me in the shape to your castle. I went to Camelot because of her. Why? To make trial of your pride, to judge the truth of the great reputation attached to the round table. She also sent me to do what? <laughs> to kill Guinevere. She wanted Guinevere to die of fright. Why? Well, to, you know, some of the versions, Morgan and Arthur, you know, well, you know. Mm -hmm. thus Mordred, who becomes Arthur's bane. Etc. So, you, you, sh you should come back home and meet her because she's your aunt after all. The ugly fat squat one. He's kind of going, no, I don't really think I need to. So he makes his way back home. And tells Arthur everything, doesn't conceal anything. It says 2506. This belt caused the scar I bear on my neck. No. Not quite, but okay. This is the injury and damage that I have suffered for the cowardice and covetousness that seized me there. This is the token of the dis dishonesty I was caught committing. And now I must wear it as long as I live. For a man may hide his misdeed, but never erase it. In other words, he always thinks about it. He doesn't forget it. For where, where once it takes root, the stain can never be lifted. Now, the poet, I think, is getting at some extremely deep theological issues there. He's talking about the stain of sin. He's talking about the fall of Adam and Eve. Notice, I think the poet is implying an individual cannot remove that stain. It can only be removed how? Well, within the Christian tradition by somebody else. Okay? And not by wearing a green sash. The king consoles the knight. The whole court laughs about it. Notice, Sir Gowan's not laughing. He doesn't think this is funny. Courtesy agrees that the lords and ladies belong to the table. Each member of the brotherhood should wear such a belt. This belt, by the way, is the belt that is still worn today by members of the Order of the Garter that the queen confers yearly when she hands out her honors. Men and women now are made members of the Order of the Garter. That is, this green sash. Okay? And the motto that you get at the end there, Aniswaki Mali Passe, Old French, evil be to him who evil thinks. The motto was embroidered on the blue velvet garter worn by knights of the garter. The highest order of English knighthood bestowed by the sovereign. According to Frasoir, 
the French chronicler. The order was instituted about 1344. So what the poet has just done is he's given us the foundation story of this order of knighthood. The highest order of knighthood. And what is it saying about the highest order of knighthood? What must it acknowledge? Cowardice. Human nature? Cowardice. Cowardice? Sin. I'm fallen. I'm not perfect. I can't do it all on my own. Okay? Now, your text said, you know, the poem dates 1375 to 1400. I said it's 1350 to 75. That's on the basis of the language that describes the armor and everything. But I think it also it fits better with the founding date of the Order of the Garter. Okay? And then you have a couple of pictures from illustrations from the manuscript uh, there, which I'm not going to talk about. Okay, go to Chaucer. Okay. 1021, uh, what, 40 minutes, 45 minutes? Um, Chaucer, you've got his dates there. 13, according to this text, 1343 to 1400. Most biographies don't date his birth to exactly 1343. They just say mid-1340s. We know that because Chaucer, um, in a document, a court document, says, you know, that he's 16, and by the basis of that date, you know, we get the mid-1340s. A couple of interesting things about him. It's when he was, I believe, 16 or so, he was taken captive in the, the um, Hundred Years' War by the French, okay? And he was ransomed by the English king personally. That is, the English king personally paid for the ransom to get Chaucer's freedom. Now, we don't know exactly why. Other than it's pretty clear there was some kind of relationship there. Oh, sinus is driving me crazy. And it may be Chaucer, even though he was only 16, was a spy. Okay. He then comes back, starts writing, works in the um, custom house for a while, and then dies. He writes a bunch of poems which we're not reading, obviously. But you've got a list of them. Well, it's not really quite a list. But you've got a description of them. Beginning uh, page 295. Kind of a list of them in order. Book of the Duchess, 1368. Okay, which is about the death of Blanche, John of Gaunt's wife. John of Gaunt, this is the John of Gaunt in Richard II and Henry IV, part one, Duke of, North, um, uh, Duke of Lancaster, okay, who was in line to the king, but he was very long living, lived a long uh, life, and very, very powerful. Okay? His wife died, Chaucer wrote kind of a book to help console him. All right? House of Fame, 1377. Parliament of Fowls, 1380, which is exactly what it sounds like. A parliament held by birds. Okay. Um, Troilus and Cressida, 1385. Big, long poem, by the way. Um, Legend of Good Women, 1380s. And then sometime, probably late 1380s, maybe as early as 1385. He starts writing the tales that become the Canterbury Tales. But he dies, apparently, with them unfinished. Why do I say, apparently, with them unfinished? Because, page 295, although the work as it stands includes 24 tales and runs to over 17,000 lines, the Canterbury Tales was far complete, far from complete, at the end of Chaucer's life. How do we know? Well... The general prologue begins, and Chaucer says, notice by the way, there's um, page opposite 294, uh, on page 294, you have a 
The first page of Chaucer's Tell of Melibe from the Ellesmere Manuscript for the Canterbury Tales. This manuscript is now in California at the University of um, Huntington, San, uh, the Huntington Library in San Marino. Right? And you have there an image of Chaucer. Right? We have several images of Chaucer. They all look alike. So we have a pretty good idea of what Chaucer looked like. Okay? So in the Canterbury Tales, in the general prologue, he says that one day he's going on pilgrimage and he rides and stops at the Tabard Inn in Southwark. Southwark is an area south of London on the south side of the Thames River. It's almost directly, well, not quite. I was going to say it's almost directly south of where today St. Paul's is, but it's really kind of south and east of there. Right? The Tabard Inn no longer survives. Southwark, as a district, does. Southwark Cathedral is built on the site of the original Southwark Cathedral, and there's a monument to Chaucer in there. Chaucer, however, is buried where? But no. Where do you tend to bury poets in England? Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey. Okay? You can't walk into Poets Corner without stepping on some dead poet. It's, it's the original Dead Poet Society. They're all over the place, just you know, scattered hither and not, hither and not. Right? So he says he was there getting ready for his own pilgrimage to Canterbury. When in came what? 29 pilgrims. Okay? 29 pilgrims. And he tells us that the host of the Tabard Inn, Harry Bailey is this guy's name. We actually know it. He's referred to once in the poem. Harry Bailey comes up with this idea. He says, y'all are making your way down to Can Canterbury, right? And they say yes. He says, okay. So the y'all is 29 plus 1, because that's Chaucer. So total of 30. He says, tell you what, let's do this. I'll come with you. And to while away the time, you will each tell two tales going and two tales coming. 30 times 4 is 120. You'll each tell two tales going, two tales coming. And you all have to agree right here, right now, I get to be the judge of the best tale. And whoever I determine tells the best tale, we will collectively pay that person's expenses. So, 30 people, because he'll be involved in the payment of that, We'll pay the expenses for one person, and that one person will, you know, get this pilgrimage all, you know, expenses paid, essentially. And so they agree, all right? That's in the general prologue. That's at the very beginning. Harry Bailey, as the tales progress, however, seems to make amendments to the original agreement. My professor of Chaucer when I was a graduate student, his name is Charles Mormon. If you do any research, if you decide to write a book, Canterbury Tales or whatever, you're going to come across his name because he was one of the foremost Chaucer scholars of the 20th century. Okay? His professors were like the trinity of Chaucerian professors of all time. George Lyman Kittredge and uh, Lumiansky, and I can't remember the third one. I mean, big, big names. Charlie, that's what he went by, always used to argue in class. He thought the Canterbury Tales were complete. And it's made that argument on the basis of what Harry Bailey says throughout the tales. Because we get at one point, and they've not 
gotten to Canterbury yet. And Harry Bailey says, now that we are half done, we have not heard 60 tales. I think we've heard 12. I'm not positive, but I think. There's only 24 tales total. We get to the last tale, the Parsons tale. And Harry Bailey says, kind of in the lead up to it, now that we have one more to go. And what Mormon always argued was that Chaucer realized, there is no way on God's green earth I'm going to write 120 of these tales. I don't have it in me. And so that he was telling his readers, don't expect 120. I'm, I'm whittling that number down. Well, why did he want to write 120? Well, your text mentions the Italian writer, Boccaccio, who wrote a little book called The Decameron. The Decameron has how many tales? You have 10 people each telling a tale over 10 nights. You've got 100 tales set during the plague. They leave the city, they go off to a villa, and to while away the time and wait for people to die, they, ten lords and ladies, each tell a tale. Chaucer's trying to out Boccaccio Boccaccio. He's trying to outdo him. Okay? Boccaccio creates this frame upon which to build his story. The plague, ten people go out in the country, they spend 10 days, they each tell a night, they each tell a story every night, okay? all 10 of them every night tell a story, 100 tales. Chaucer follows that and creates his own frame. Well, what's his frame? Pilgrimage to Canterbury. Why Canterbury? It's where Thomas of Becket was murdered in, I don't remember the date off the top of my head. I put it on the board. Um, 1187, something like that, whatever it was, was murdered, okay? And he was beatified. He was made a saint pretty quickly, like within 12 years after that, okay? So he becomes, for the Middle English folks at least, a patron saint. They have all kinds of saints. Edward, the first Edward, King Edward, who was killed by Danes, he was a saint, Cuthbert, yesterday was Cuthbert, no, today's St. Cuthbert's feast day, Cuthbert of Lindisfarne, he was a saint, whole bunch of them. But Thomas of Becket, you know, he's a recent saint, so people want to flock to him. So look how the poem opens. And notice, you get the Middle English version, right? You didn't get the Middle English, but you kind of had it, of Sir Down of Green Knight. Why? Because that is unintelligible to a modern English reader. Chaucer's Middle English is intelligible. Why? I know there's some difficult parts. Because it's the English out of which our English develops. The English of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight is not the dialect that develops into early modern English. Chaucer's is the dialect that becomes Shakespeare's. Okay? Meaning Shakespearean London, not Shakespeare's Warwickshire. Because the Warwickshire accent probably is a little bit closer to the Sir Gowan and the Green Knight stuff. So, general prologue. Juan de Capriel with his sure salta, the drought of March has perished to the rota, and by the lavery vine in switch liqueur, of which virtue and jondred is the fleur. In spirit hath in every halt and hath the tender crop of Sunday young son, hath in the ram, hath his course irona. And small a fool is mocking melody, the slapping of the nicht with open ear. Sa pricketh him nature in her courages, van longen folk to goin' on pilgrimages. What is the first 11 lines saying? By the way, that's all an introductory adverbial phrase. When, dot, 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 dot comma, then. When what happens? We had a little taste of this towards the end of February here in Murfreesboro. Temperatures shot up, right? Almost at 80 degrees. 
People were out in shorts and t-shirts. Why? Because January was so freaking cold. It's horrible. Okay? It's going to be cold this week after a couple of warm days last week. But once really April comes around, people are going to be shedding clothes left and right, coming to school, you know, barely dressed sometimes, I've, I've seen. Why? Cabin fever. Okay, we're in Murfreesboro. We're on the same latitude almost as L.A. Mm -hmm. London, that's about where Newfoundland is. North of Maine. <laughs> they still have snow in parts of you know, England where they're not used to actually much snow. He says, what happens? The winds pick up. The little birds come out and start singing. The blossoms start. And the people want to go on pilgrimages. Now, he might mean literal pilgrimages. He also might mean they just want to get out and go on trips, right? So some of them do what? They seek strange strands, strand shores. They go to the, um, the one in Spain. His name I can't remember. Something to compass up. Yeah, Santiago de Compostela, St. James, okay? They go to Cologne, as we're going to hear. They go to Rome. They go to Jerusalem. There's all kinds of famous places you can go to, okay? And especially from every shire's end of England to Canterbury, they wind. Wind means turn their direction to. Why? The holy blissful martyr for blissful. He's full of bliss now. Because he's dead <laughs> and in heaven. They go to him that them hath hope and win that they were sick. That's why he's a saint. He has healed people after, their, after his death. So he says, <clears throat> it happened that on a season, on a day of that season, I was at the Tabard Inn in Southwark, getting ready to make my way to Canterbury with full devout courage. A full, devout heart. I'm so pious. And at night, came into that hostelry, nine and twenty in a company of sundry folk. Lumiansky, the guy I mentioned before, wrote a book titled Of Sundry Folk. And it talks about, it's all about the pilgrims. <clears throat> what kind of folk are these? What does sundry mean? They're sundered from their homes? No. Various. What kind of classes are represented in the pilgrims? Louder? Lower classes? Who in the lower class is among the pilgrims? Yeoman. Yeoman's the guy who works in the forest. Okay. The plowman is the lowest, <clears throat> literally the lowest. This guy digs ditches for a living, okay? His brother, the, par the parson, is with him, okay? So you have those who pray, for example, the parson, Madame Eglantine, the nun's prioress and her priests three. You have the partner, the summoner. They're all included among those who pray. In other words, this is what? The church. Okay? You have those who fight. Who's that? Knight. Who tells the first tale? The knight. Okay? His son, the squire is also included in that group, okay? So that is what? The military slash nobility, okay? And then those who, what's the word? Work. Who's included here? The miller, 
the wife of Bath, the shipman, the cook, the plowman. Who's this? Everybody else. This is the breakdown, the division of society. Guess what? This is extremely old. This is Indo-European. Goes back to about 5000 BC, where you have the priests, okay, those who pray to the gods. You have the nobility, military, the chieftain, the king, etc. The warriors also. And then, why do you have to have these? Because these two couldn't live without these. These are the people who keep society running, who keep the economy moving. These are the people who, I hate to burst any bubbles, this is what, you know, this is what the, the president of every university thinks of his or her students. These are the cogs we graduate to what? Fill the jobs that are out there. Because the university has become solely what? A job placement service. Rather than what it used to be, oh, even 60, 70 years ago. A place of, God forbid, learning. Where you learn things that may not be relevant. Like reading <laughs> dead white poet, you know. <laughs> Stonemasons are down here. Yeah, I was wondering if they still existed at this point. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of cathedrals and churches and stuff being built in the 1300s. A lot of them, okay? And a lot of them took 100 years. So, you know, traditions passed on from father to son, etc. Okay? So, he starts with the night. Why? Exactly. You don't want to piss off the knights. They go first. Okay. So he starts with the knight, and he gives us a long description of the knight. Talks about how he's dressed. Knight in shining armor, right? Savannah, you went, <laughs> why? How's he dressed? Just off the boat. He hasn't had a time for a shower. His cloak is stained. His clothes are dirty. He's dusty because he's ridden from the port. Now, the port might have been the Thames right there in London. Okay. He's probably smelly. It's like he's just come back from foreign wars, and what does he do? He wants to go offer his prayers. Oh, he's a good holy knight. But we get a long description of all the battles that he fought in. Any of you familiar with the name? Show me Twitter. Show me the time. Um, Terry Jones? Yep. He's one of the Monty Python guys. He's also a medieval scholar. And he wrote a book in the mid 70s, 77, I believe, called Chaucer's Night in which he argues, now a lot of Chaucer scholars don't agree with him. In fact, a lot of Chaucer scholars wish he died before he'd written this book uh, <laughs> because of what he says. He makes the argument in Chaucer's Night that everything Chaucer says about the night, while it appears to be praiseworthy, he then goes on a list of battles and that completely undercuts him. Why? Because most of these battles were mercenary battles. Most of these battles were battles fought against other Christians. You go off on the crusades, and who are you supposed to be killing? The damned Saracens, the infidels. And yet, many of the crusades were fought against by Roman Catholic Christians against Eastern Orthodox Christians. Okay? Not not dividing up the Saracens' booty, but dividing up, you know, your brothers kind of stuff. So we get the knight, 
And he's praised one up one side, down the other. And after him comes his son, the squire. And we get a description of him. And we were told he is what? Line 80. A lover and a lusty bachelor. Vigorous for lusty. Okay? It could also mean he loves his pleasure. Locks crow, that is curled, as they were led in press. Crow, notice, curled. C-R-U-L-L, curled. What happens? Chaucer can't spell? Well, in Parliament of Fowls, he mentions the Thrida Brida. It's a principle, history of the English language, called metathesis, where sounds get reversed. This is actually third bird. But the original Old English was thrid, right? as we still see, you know, thrice, three, etc. So the thrida, brida, and then you somehow you end up getting third instead of thrid, okay? So, 20 years old and such, notice, he can sing, he can dance, he can ride, etc. We get it, the idea, he's going to develop into a proper knight. What else? We're also told he shows proper devotion that is filial duty to his father. How? He carves before him at the table. He carves the meat, cuts up the roast, right? They have with them a yeoman. Not going to say anything about him. So knight and squire, I want you to remember. Then we get the nun, a prioress, line 118. That other smiling was full, simple, and coy. <laughs> Her greatest oath was, oh, my St. Louis. And you got a footnote down there. St. Eligius, 7th century Bishop Noyon of France, patron saint of both goldsmiths and blacksmiths. Why in the world would a nun swear by the patron saint of goldsmiths and blacksmiths? Why wouldn't she swear by Mary? Okay. Possibly. Well, we're going to find out she wears something around her neck. She was called Madame Eglantine. That's her actual name. She sang the song, excuse me, she sang the service, that is Mass, divinely. In tune in her nose, full seemly. She sounds like Fran Drescher. <laughs> the nanny, singing. Yeah. After uh, she speaks French fair and fetishly, fetishly, elegantly, after the school of Stratford at Bow. Why? Because French of Paris was to her unknown. So what does that mean, after the school of Stratford at Bow? This isn't a famous French school. It means, she says, parlez-vous Francais? That's how she speaks French. She speaks it with a thick accent, and she doesn't speak it the way proper Parisians do. Because if you're going to speak French, you should speak Parisian French, not Norman French. It's Norman French that enters and that modifies the English language. It's Norman French is the reason why we have warranty and guarantee. Guardian, warden. The G-U-A-R-W, it's the same thing. A warranty and a guarantee, exact same thing. It's because of the intrusion of Norman French, we have attorney of law, as opposed to the good old native Anglo-Saxon lawyer. The ur is one who does, like an actor. The ur, one who acts, etc. Okay? So what else are we told about her? She's pretty fastidious with how she eats. She eats so carefully she doesn't leave any grease on a cup when she drinks from it. Not because she wipes it afterwards with a handkerchief. She wipes her lips so clean, there's no grease on them, and then she eats. Okay. What else? She gets really upset if anybody 
harms one of her dogs. And how does she feed her dogs? What does she feed her dogs? Kibbles and bits? White bread. Now, we think of white bread. Ew, gag. But in this day, white bread, that is the best bread you can get. Why? Because brown bread has what in it? No. What? It's got pieces of the husk. It's gritty. Really, I mean, some brown bread today is gritty. It's really gritty. Gritty enough where you can bite into it that it would also sometimes have little teeny bits of the grinding stone. Break your teeth. White bread is very, very, very well ground. Okay? She feeds that to her dogs. She's a prioress. What do prioresses slash nuns do when they become nuns? What do they swear? Chastity, poverty, and sometimes silence. Okay? How is she doing on the poverty part? Because she also wears around her neck a gold brooch with a big old A on it. Scarlet letter, anybody? <laughs> What's the A stand for? Amor vincit omnia. Love conquers all. But it's amor. It's not agape. It's not divine love. It's romantic love. Completely out of place. She should not be wearing this thing. Okay? What else are we told her? We're told about her looks, okay? Her forehead is almost a span broad, I believe. Span, thumb to fingertip. It doesn't mean this way broad. It means this way broad. She's got a really big forehead for some reason. <laughs> Tone head, you know. <laughs> okay, so after her, we get the monk. So we've had nobility, now we get the church. But he's not going to follow this order all the way. He's going to start to mix it up a little bit. Because we're not going to go through all the members of the church. <clears throat> a monk, fair for the maestry, outrider, loved venery. Now your gloss tells you venery means hunting. And it does. But it also suggests something else. Because what's at the root of that? It's the same V-E-N as in venereal, right? <clears throat> He's a manly man, you know. Uh, to be an abbot, able, etc., etc. He's got lots of horses. He doesn't really care for the rule of St. Um, Mar or St. Morris or St. Benedict. St. Benedict, the founder of Western monasticism, who came up with a rule for monastics that was pretty strict. Okay. No, he, he doesn't hold to those. Why? 174. Because it was old and somewhat strict. Eh, it's the old days. We don't believe that anymore. We're progressive now. Okay. No, he holds after the new world the course. He gave not of that text a pulled hymn that says that hunters are not holy men. He doesn't believe the writer who said hunters can't be holy men or holy men can't be hunters. So he kind of says or thinks, why should he study and make himself mad or crazy upon a book and cloister always to pour, that is to read, or to work with his hands and labor is St. Augustine ordered? That's Austin. How shall the world be? What good does it do to the world to have some monk reading a book, pouring over a book, and praying and working in the field? It's as important a question in Chaucer's day as it is for a lot of people today. He, no, let, let Austin have his own work. Let St. Augustine in the 4th century have his own work, 5th century have his own work, 
and I'll do mine. Therefore, he was a precursor, all right, a hard rider. That is, he's got lots of horses. Why? Because he tires them out. All right. What else? We're getting a description of his clothing. His sleeves are fur lined. He's supposed to be poor. All right. He has a pen, a love knot, we're told. In the greater end there was. His head is bald, shows or shines like glass. Now, why would his head shine? Is it because he polishes it? Some bald guys do. Yeah. Sweaty. His face looks like it had been anointed, oily skinned. He was a lord full fat. In, in good point, his eyes steep and rolling. That is, bulging eyes and rolling. It seemed as a furnace of a lead or of lead. His boots were supple, his horse braided state. He was a fair prelate, not pale like a distressed ghost. He was a fat swan, left he best of any rope. Talks about his palfrey, etc. So, how is he doing with obeying the vows that he has sworn? Not so well. Then we get the friar. A wanton and a merry. Wanton. Pleasure seeking. Wanton also means sexually loose. Okay. He was a limiter, a full solemn man. That is, he had license to um, sell his indulgences in particular areas. In all the orders for is none that can so much of dalliance and fair language. The four orders of monks, Kasha says, there was none that knows so much of dalliance, flirtation, and fair language, that is, smooth talk. He had made for many marriage of young women at his own cost. At his own cost. That means he pulls out his wallet and he pays the costs for their marriages. Well, this guy is just naturally generous and outgoing. Hmm. No. Why? Read the next line. For unto his order he was a noble post. Now your boss tells you to her. I think Chaucer means a little more than that. He enabled these women to get married because he was a noble post for them too. He's talking about his erection, I think. I could be wrong. could be my own dirty mind. <laughs> Listen to what else Chaucer says. Well beloved and familiar was he with Franklin's overall his conceit, and with worthy women of the town. Why? Because he had power of confession. He could hear your confessions. Well, what's part of confession? Penance. So from the Franklins, what does he prescribe as penance? Well, write me a little check, and you'll be absolved of your sins. Well, write me a big check. And you'll be more absolved of your sins. Um, ladies, come on here. That's why he pays for their marriages. Okay. He makes confession easy. Do they really have to be contrite for their sins? No. He said himself more than a curate, for of his order he was licensed for sweetly hurry confession. Pleasant was his absolution. Thereas he wished to have a good pittance, that is, donation. For unto a poor order for to give a sign that a man is well shriven. That is, write a check for the order that shows, oh, this person really you know, is sorry for his or her sin. For many, for many men is so hard of heart, he may not weep, although him sore smart. Many a man, it's hard to really be contrite, but it's really easy to write a check. Right? Whole lot easier to see something on TV. Oh, I feel so bad. Here, this will make me feel better. And donate. Therefore, instead of weeping and prayers, men may give silver to the poor friars. 
His tippet, that is his bag, was full stuffed of knives and pins for to give young wives. Kind of consider these little bumble brides. Certainly he had a merry note that is singing voice. Well could he sing, play on a lyre. Song she could win the prizes, etc., etc. He knew the taverns well, every hostler and tapster, better than a leper or a bakester, because he reasoned to himself, why should a worthy man as he, accorded not as by his faculty? It doesn't make sense to hang around with lepers and bakers. And yet, who did his model hang around with? Lepers and beggars. Okay. Why? Because it may not advance to deal with such poor folk. But all with rich and sellers of victuals, and over all thereof profit should arise. Courteous he was, and lowly of service. There was no man nowhere so virtuous. Okay. So Chaucer praises the guy with being virtuous at one point, and then you know, very next sentence, wait, just takes his knees out from under him. So what's he doing so far with almost every character? Praise, tops the knees out. Why? Puts them on more or less equal footing. Puts them on equal footing. Why else? They're human. Chaucer is showing us what society was like in the late 14th century. He's also showing us, or he's going to show us, two, only two, thoroughly positive characters out of all three. Including himself, by the way. The two that he praises, the two that he doesn't say anything negative about, who do you think they are? The parson. The poor parson and his brother, the plowman. Why? Because the parson does not rent out his job so that he can go live in London. The parson takes his job seriously. How seriously does he take it? He will ride and walk through snow, fire, wind, and hail to serve his parishioners. He will give of his own into the tithe basket when his parishioners can't. Okay. He will talk about how a pastor ought to lead because he says, how can you expect sheep to be gold if the pastor is shit? And he uses that very word. How, if, if they're supposed to be perfect, how... They, they need a model for perfection. That's what the priest ought to be. Okay? The plowman, we're told, is so quote-unquote Christian, he will dig your field without taking pay if you need your field dug and you're poor. He will go help somebody else pull their cart out of the hole and won't accept pay. Okay? He... he Kind of uses this throughout for only these two. Every other character, he undercuts. The wife of Beth. What are we told about her? She's really good at what she does, weaving. She's had multiple husbands. Okay. But what else? If you get in front of her in line for the offering at church, and especially if you're a young woman, oh, it really bends her out of shape. Why? She wants to be seen out there in front. Okay. And he gives us a whole bunch of other descriptions of all the other pilgrims. Okay. We're going to stop there. Um, because we need to get on. For Thursday, have the wife of Bath's prologue and tale read. And let's maybe have a quiz over